introductions. Everyone just did a lovely introduction. Uh, so I'm Rachel Switsky. Uh, this is me. Hello, Research Park. So, um, I, I, and yes, I'm the new director for the Siegel Center for Design, but unfortunately this, 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 uh, this presentation actually covers very little about the Siegel Center for Design, and that's a whole other presentation that I can give, and I, I apologize if anyone is coming here to learn about the strategy and all the amazing things that we've been doing over the last seven months since I started. Um, but actually, I thought what we could do was go into some, um, I call it leadership lessons learned along key life moments, which Laura uh, just went through a big summary of what those are, as I've listed a lot of the, those uh, elements here that are from the, my lovely introduction from Laura. Um, so I, I picked nine uh, key moments in my career that I wanted to <laughs> share my wisdom, and, and it helps you understand like how I got to this place, and, and why, well, you know, what are my collected uh, knowledge and wisdom, and what have I learned along the way, and then, you know, why is it that I, I'm you know, literally here at the University of Illinois? Because, you know, my, my most you know, recent chapter, as you see in this, this list of nine. So, um, my, my, I hope my lessons learned are, um, are, are going to be valuable to the different the range of folks in this room. So, we'll get started with number one, my, my first lesson learned. So, I, I grew up in uh, Sycamore and in Cal area, which is up in northern Illinois. And I don't know if people are familiar with that area, but it's very small. It's very, very, very small. And as a child, uh, I was not good at, at being in a small place. I was very um, active and very, uh, uh, I mean, I think that this was in the 70s, and I think if I was a child now, I'd probably be diagnosed with ADD, where I just had a lot of uh, things I wanted to accomplish in the world as a six-year-old. And uh, but it was very difficult in which to do in a tiny town with a sycamore and a cow, because they, you know, you can walk from like one end to the other in like half an hour. So, um, but I, I learned very early as a child that my first lesson, leadership lesson, is you know, you don't, don't be bored, don't be boring. That that is, how do you take your 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 uh, if you're bored? How do you take that that um that that that, that pressure in order to kind of you know like the, the the anxiety of boredom? How do you do something with that? So at an early age, my my parents gave me one of my favorite, most inspirational books which is Big Bird's Busy Book, which was published in 1975. And as it says on here, you know, it has an amazing collection of things to make, things to do, games and stories and recipes, too. So this kept me very busy and very not bored for the most part, though my parents would disagree. I was very complaining and bored as a child. Uh, but this, this book gave me a lot of things in order, you know, it, it, it started kind of grasping my attention and giving me inspiration and really feeding into my creativity as, as a youth. And, you know, I, I, I think about this book, and I, I love the title, The Alliteration of Big Bird's Busy Book. Um, so, actually, Big Bird will, will just remember Big Bird as we go towards my life journey, because actually all these, these components all kind of come together. Um, so Big Bird's Busy Book was very, um, was very invigorating to me, a bored child in, uh, in Northern Illinois, small town in Northern Illinois. So as I, as I grew from small child to um, a raging adolescent and uh, you know, very, realizing more and more that I was not built for a small town and that as my, uh, as my boredom increased as a, as a teenager, you know, what's the equivalent of Big Bird's Busy Book um, as, as a teenager? So my, my next uh, life lessons learned as a teenager was that, you know, I, I, I couldn't complain if there was nothing going on in my small town, but I actually had to own my own fun, like own the fun, bring the fun to me if the fun is not there. So my interpretation of that is I, I decided to create my own production company as a, as a teenager called Tangle Monsters. You can see at the top, this is a flyer from a, a, one of the punk rock shows that I started producing in my small town. So my small town was next to DeKalb, which was a college town, and I just became, I became a music promoter um, because I love music and I wanted to encourage bands to come to me because my parents wouldn't allow me to drive to Chicago unless I snuck to Chicago by my, you know, with my friends which, of course, I never did. Um, but anyway, I brought, I know, here we have um, 16 Tons, who's a champagne band. Um, very exciting. But I, yeah, I booked a lot of bands as a teenager, and uh, just fed. I wasn't a musician yet. I was just very into music. And uh, three bands, three bucks. We held them at the local church. Um, I had my friends kind of work the door and security. And so it was a good time. And I started realizing my entrepreneurial management skills at, at a young age. 
So I had to step into the next um, chapter of my life, which was my first time here at University of Illinois. And you know, of course, you come to college in order to, you know, lessons learned. You, know, you find your passions, you follow your passions. But you know, it's not so much about following your passions. To me, it was more about starting a band. That was very important to me. Now, I, I, uh, I was, um, you know, I was a freshman in college here, so my freshman ID. And uh, I uh, early on discovered industrial design, and uh, and I you know threw myself into the studio. And as, as industrial designers will know, and I'm sure many people in this room, when you find your passion, you 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 embrace that passion. You start just diving in, heads down, because you just can't get enough of it. And especially as like a learning new designer, you know you're you're stumbling, but you're you're continuing to find your voice of who you are as a designer. Now, I also was continuing to find my voice as a punk rock musician in an all girl band called Corn Dolly. Now, having this uh, design um, actions and you know, activities through my, uh, my college career, and then on uh, the other side, being a you know, punk rock bassist in an all girl band, it, it helped me nourish the two together. Because uh, punk rock and being in a band, in the same way when I was a music producer, or a music promoter in um, in high school, I also, you know, I picked up a, a you know, bass myself, and then, you know, joined a band and learned collaboration, improvisation, learned about brand building, learned about graphic design, learned about how you work with others and how you book tours, which require lots of project management. Uh, you know, how is it that we need to promote ourselves? What's the narrative behind the band? So these are all these activities that would complement my design training that I got with my BFA. At the, um, at the University of Illinois. So, but, um, you know, finished up my degree, and, you know, my career was calling. And I, I unfortunately quit this band, which was sad, but I, you know, I do went to my next chapter, which was um, getting a job at the Cooper Hewitt. So, the next, next, like, lessons learned is everybody should move to New York City after college, especially <laughs> after growing up in a very tiny town in northern Illinois. Uh, so I got the opportunity to work at the Cooper Hewitt. I applied, I saw like, a flyer on the, the wall of the art and design building about internships, and I only applied on a whim and somehow got this position under the, the curator of contemporary design at the Cooper Hewitt. Um, this woman named Ellen Lofton, who was one of my you know, first mentors, which is you know, she's an amazing person in which to work for. So at the Cooper Hewitt, I, I was a curatorial assistant on the team, a very small team. And one of the big things I worked on in the um, early 90s was one of the like, seminal uh, exhibitions called Mechanical Brides, Women and Machines from Home to Office. So that's the catalog, and here's a, like, a picture from the exhibit. And it was just an amazing experience working with Ellen and working at the Hewitt and just being applying my, my love and passion for design and my love and passion for design history all in one in being able to explore how do you now communicate this to people and how do you learn about these, you know, these, these physical uh, contexts of moving through spaces to be able to experience and understand and educate. Um, so that was an amazing experience in working with them. Um, with so between exhibitions, um, I, I also, Ellen introduced me into her New York design circle. And so I became a baby designer in this, like, through these, these amazing, talented New York designers in the early 90s. And, uh, you know, my next lesson learned that I will, um, you know, uh, will share with you that it's really important to learn Port Express and Photoshop 1.0. Now, this might be slightly dated, uh, maybe by a couple years, but because I had learned these tools, or, you know, in my college uh, experience, I was way ahead of the path in terms of knowing these digital ways of uh, manipulation and applying it into design. So me as a baby designer was able to work with all sorts of, you know, these, these amazing, uh, really cool designers in New York City. Um, and one was this uh, designer named Mike Mills. And he was, uh, he was doing a lot of work with, um, uh, just cool, like with the music industry, and did this maybe this they might be giants, uh, work with the album stuff. Uh, X Girl was a uh, collaboration with the Beastie Boys and Sonic Youth. And, you know, this, I just hated this work. It was awful. Like, no, but it was very cool because it was matching my design passion, my, my digital uh, you know, knowledge and experience with these tools, and then you know my music passions. It was, it was a perfect place for me to play. But I was still like the baby designer in this whole, whole um, in this whole scene. And uh, after a while, you know, you, as you grow in your career, you know, as, as a baby designer, my first job out of college was a, a tremendous experience. You know, all sorts of uh, 
a great, great opportunities and, and people to learn from. But there was a point that, um, you know, I no longer wanted to do a lot of the digital work for people, but I needed to grow as a designer. And, and I went into my next chapter with a lot of advice from my, um, you know, New York um, design mentors, where they said, you know what, you should go back to school. You know, so, and I, I, uh, I ended up back at the University of Illinois, you know, to get my advanced degree. And it's important from another leadership lesson, it's, you know, to get an advanced degree. I came back here for my MFA, but, you know, who's kidding? I wasn't here just to get an advanced degree, I was here to start another band. <laughs> it's a great place to start another band. So while I was working, I, in my master's degree, I was able to take advantage um, and create a very multidisciplinary degree of human-computer interaction from a design standpoint. Um, and this is this is like the mid '90s, so it was a it wasn't didn't really exist in in a, in a, in a capacity of a major as it you know doesn't really exist now as a major. But I was making up my own, and you know I was uh, taking from technology and, and working with people in history and education and of course design and uh, and you know putting that all together and using that as my MFA um, um, MFA uh, deep dive. Um, and, and using it and having it as a, you know, my, my, my industrial design work. But I also was in another band um, that I started, uh, a trio called Sarge. And um, uh, this was, again, another opportunity in which to practice both um, you know, these complementary skills of like management and design and, and uh, passion and, and experience and creating a whole new narrative and, and a brand. This was also at the beginning of like a the, uh, the, the World Wide Web and the, you know, the internet, and uh, being able to um, uh, you know, even communicate with fans in a very different way than in my previous uh, band, the Corn Dolly. So we, uh, you know, we started touring. We did about 10 tours uh, around the US. Um, somehow I was able to fit that in with my teaching and, uh, and, and classes, but it worked. And, uh, it, but we, we, uh, I bought um, a power book, a big brick power book, and uh, a Kodak digital camera. They make those still, right? Uh, so, but we went around and we took pictures and created a blog and a community with the fans and fans would show up and they want to have their picture taken so that they be on the blog and it was, it was very interesting to see the dynamics of building communities, you know, food, digital experiences and it was very early days of the internet and uh, it was just being, having, um, you know, ha studying it and doing computer interaction within an academic setting but then living it in regards to you know being a, a, a you know being a band and having a context in which to develop these skills and be on the ground to understand how people are using the internet and how we use it, it was a great experience. So um, after I graduated, I finished my MFA and unfortunately left this band, which is sad. Um, Kind of, but that's a whole other presentation. Um, I, I jumped into the, the foray of the dot com boom, and I, I joined a company called Razorfish, which was at that time like a big digital agency. And like somehow I became a consultant, and I guess this could be a leadership lesson. And I fall into consulting? Sure. I, I never, I didn't know what a consultant meant when I joined uh, Razorfish. I didn't know what it meant to me. I had been this, in this dude's design community in New York, and it had been very, I didn't think about it as consulting, I didn't have clients per se. And all of a sudden I was at Razorfish, and I was a consultant, and I'm working with companies like Pets.com. This is the biggest, this is still around, right? Does anyone know that? This is probably too dated, right? I'm, I'm showing my age here. But this was a big, big, you know, startup back in the dot-com boom. Um, along with many others, like Pets.com, which of course you've never heard of because they're all they all died in the, in the bust. Um, but I did a lot of work with clients and startups, um, both in startups and also in big, uh, big clients. And I started applying my skills of human-computer interaction. I did a lot of stuff like this, which we still do a lot of. But boxes and arrows, this is like familiar to people. Where you start strategizing about, um, you know, I did all that work at the Cooper Hewitt, which is the physical and the training within industrial design where you're understanding like a, how, is it, how is it that you are communicating to people about the use of objects. Well now we're stepping into the beginning of the internet and all these startups and all these, these websites that need to be designed and you start thinking about the, this, uh, this, this uh, digital space that needs to have a context in which you move through. So how do you start putting yourselves in, you know, in you know, the perspective of a user who has to find information and understand what that information means? So this is where I started a lot of my um, you know, digital uh, application of my degrees and, and uh, where I, you know, what, what, how it is that you start creating a digital experience and lots of boxes and arrows for lots and lots of clients. 
So I have a part two of my razor fish experience, um, which is that there was, um, actually, I, I, I finished at school in, in 98, uh, in my MFA, and kind of really got in at the ground floor of the dot-com boom, and you can see, you know, oof, I got super high, and it was like madness out there. Um, in terms of when I got to travel all over the US, it was, it was very exciting time. But there was also a dot-com bust that happened a couple years later. And uh, that was kind of crazy when that happened because money started drying up and um, I started experiencing you know, weird things like razorfish being bought and then being bought again and then being bought again and then being split up but then being bought again. And I went through about seven different reorgs as razorfish razor as a company kept switching hands from uh, you know, different like behemoths versus uh, you know, uh, holding companies and Again, I, I, this is all new to me. I'm a designer, I, a punk rock designer, punk rock consultant. I have no clue how any of this worked or why. But you start understanding that whenever there's a reorg, there's, um, there's, there's, there's panic, and as they're trying to kind of reconfigure the companies, as they're squishing the companies together, I learn very quickly, and this is a very important leadership lesson for us at university as well, you take advantage of chaos. And taking advantage of chaos means how do you not get sucked into the politics? Or how do you understand and observe the politics, but then figure out what is it that you need to accomplish, and how do you start sliding into certain things as people aren't noticing? Um, so I took advantage of the chaos that was happening during these like monthly reorgs, practically, at Razorfish. And I found my way from the US to a position in the Razorfish London office. Yay! <laughs> London office for a, a three-month adventure, a three-month project that ended up being three years. You know, I just found, I just, I loved it, I loved the clients, but it also, from my, you know, human-centered design perspective, it was great to start learning about different cultures. And I got to work all across Europe and Western Europe and Eastern Europe and started to conduct design research in all these different areas of, of this whole new part of the world that I, I hadn't been exposed to before. And, and as I had been doing several years of research that applied to our designs that then eventually got built, um, that it, it allows you to start you know, just collecting knowledge about cultures and different cultures. And as a designer, how do people experience different cultures? And what do you, what, how do you test your assumptions and hypotheses by, by why you, you know, what you think you know about people, but the cultures change and your assumptions have to change. So it was great, great, great exposure and great learnings for someone like me, who was, like anybody, who could be able to uh, you know, just learn a lot from this and apply it to our design processes. So what I also learned from this experience is I was working with all these European clients. And you know, it's, it's one thing to be an expat. You don't realize how much of an American you are until you like, move out of the country, which is, you know, everyone should move out of the country at some point in time, just to see what it's like to be American and, and uh, apple pie and all that. It's, it's, very, very, it's, it's funny but sad at the same time. But having that expat experience was wonderful. But I also found the life lesson was I really need to leverage my Midwestern chops. <laughs> you know, having been here, you know, just both like being a Midwesterner, not being friendly, and like, hey, let's roll over sleeves and like build a bar, uh, you know, like high five, you know, all that stuff. Um, it actually, I, and this is something I would never have recognized, but my European clients. <laughs> love my Midwestern charm, and they love my Midwestern accent. And they said it was much easier to understand me than my posh English colleagues, because they, I, I reminded them of newscasters they'd heard from America. <laughs> <laughs> so they really appreciated that, because they were so used to this tenor and tone, and somehow, I, I sound like these guys. <laughs> so, who knew? <laughs> All right, so moving on, uh, I spent seven years at Razorfish, and it was, it was an incredible experience just to get my feet wet. And what does it mean to be a designer? What does it mean to be a consultant? What does it mean to you know, be based you know, in the US and Europe and I have that kind of that, you know, the, the world in front of me to learn from? And, and to take advantage of that as well, I, I decided to take a sabbatical. So I left Razorfish, and, and maybe it was because I'd grown up in an academic family, and it was like, 
you know, my dad had taken sabbaticals from the NIU, and I was like, oh, yeah, I take a sabbatical. So, and I think it's really important, you know, as another, give yourself a break when you need it. And I had just spent all this time, seven years, like, on a plane every week, and you're in an office park for, you know, I mean, you're, you're you know, inside, a, you, know, a, you know, cubicles, and you just don't get any fresh air. So my, my sabbatical was very much like, you need to be eight hours a day, outside, on a bike, with a backpack, seeing vistas like this, and vistas like that, and getting lots of inspiration just from nature. I just didn't want to be in front of a computer, I didn't want to be in an office park. I just needed a break and just get fresh air and exercise and, and just learning and meeting people and getting to understand another culture but like not having to like profit from it or commercialize it in any way whatsoever. So this was a great experience and I all highly recommend in any way to take a break, maybe not to on a bicycle to travel through China for a month, but <laughs> Uh, but it, it's, it's very, very uh, highly recommended from a leadership lesson. So I spent six months on my sabbatical in Asia, and then I thought, you know what, I've been away from the U.S. for a while, I'm going to come back to the U.S., and that's when I was recruited into a company called IDEO. So IDEO was just good timing, and you know, skills and timing just blessed me, and I joined IDEO in, um, in uh, 2007. And in 2007, I spent just about uh, a little over a decade at IDEO. So IDEO is known for pioneering human-centered design process and being very, very uh, forthcoming that uh, design can have impact in the world. So they, they, you know, IDEO has been sharing this process and being the drunk of design thinking for a very long time. IDEO has been in existence for like 40 years. So I came in, you know, not, not, not like at the beginning of IDEO, but was able to come in. IDEO is always like reinventing themselves, so it was, it's. It's a good place in which to be if you're curious and, and, and want to be part and jump into the, the action. So let me just go through in human-centered design. I hope I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, human-centered design is, is really much about the aspects of observation and empathy. What is it that you're seeing and hearing out in the world, and then how do you interpret it in terms of in, in, you know, in meaning? And that's what I had been doing all along. It just didn't have this name before in the way throughout the rest of my life. And when you're IDEO, you're, you're, you're literally you're living and breathing both of these principles um, with your clients and, and you know, within the culture itself. So you're just, it's, it's very much, a, a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a company run by designers that's just in your DNA. And as you, IDEO is just a picture of like, <coughs> pictures of our studios. I was based in the mothership out in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, Palo Alto. And it's just a you know, very passionate, very creative, very design-led organization that is, um, it, it is very, it's a, it, it just serves a design and a design mind in a fantastic way. And, and one of the big, big uh, life lessons in working with IDEO is that you very much need to embrace ambiguity. That there are things that we just don't know about in the world so how is it that we're able to learn about the world in order to then design for it or find opportunities in which for improvement and impact? So this embracing ambiguity was a, it's, a, it's it's an aspect of, um, of of our of the IDEO culture, and these are the other areas of the IDEO culture, which is learning from failure, taking ownership, making others successful, collaborate, be optimistic, talk less, do more, and and these principles of the IDEO culture, which are documented in the little, the little book of IDEO, the little red book is it called, um, it, it is documented not only for I, you know, IDEO to present ourselves to clients, because this is what the clients would be buying, um, but it's in how it is that we would be working with clients, but it's also about um, how is it that we work together and what is it that you need to um, understand about the culture in order to be successful in the culture as well. So the, the idea of embracing ambiguity was, you know, if you, you're going off and doing design research, you don't, you don't know what the result is going to be. You don't know what you're going to you, you might think you know, but you're always going to find things through the human-centered design process that's going to surprise you. And, and it's not what you thought, and it's not what the clients thought. So embracing that ambiguity is just key to the success of being, you know, to being a human-centered designer, someone who is, is, is thinking with a design-thinking mindset. Um, I want to just call it a couple things within the IDEO culture that I love. I, I didn't want this whole presentation to be about IDEO, so, but I just have a couple moments of, of um, IDEO myths that I, I wanted to share that I thought was really lovely that again, I want to bring here. So, just like, so there were these moments of, you know, these, uh, these are just two posters that, um, that you see at IDEO, and um, one of my favorite is this, you know, we have this uh, Thanksgiving dinner every year, and um, they're one of the designers at IDEO, Ryan Fitzgibbon, um, who's 
great designer, you know, he took it upon himself to create a very cool poster. And maybe I love this one because I'm a pie baker, but it has just a beautiful design to it. It's just like a poster advertising our Thanksgiving dinner. And uh, I'm on the same side, like this was another one, I don't know if you did this one, but um, it's just blue shots. You know, like there's this aspect of, of, of valuing um, design and creativity in all aspects of the experience. And the fact that it's like, oh, you have flu shots on Thursday, everyone will be a reminder. You know, and there's just this beautiful poster letting everyone know. And it's just aspects of things like this that you can see at IDEO all day, every day, that, that made it such an incredible experience. Um, another experience is, and I think some of you know, like this obsession with bathrooms. <laughs> bathrooms have this captive audience. We could do another uh, presentation about bathrooms. Maybe we should. Um, but that is an idea where, where this place in which to kind of have a secret conversation, a private conversation, but that was very community-led as well. So people would, um, you know, we, we'd either have, um, you could draw on the walls or put post-its up there. I don't know if people can read it, can read it. it's in purple, but it says, um, what's your favorite charity or nonprofit organization that you support or volunteer in the Bay Area? And it's not like we couldn't ask that at, like, you know, the lunch table or whatever, but it's just like a... Then you're in the bathroom and you ponder that question, you look at all the results, and it's, it's inspiring. And it's, you know, and then you provide your own commentary, and it's just a place in which to have yet another um, avenue of inspiration and dialogue, you know, to add to your day. And you know, this would be uh, this was probably responses after a couple days. You know, they would be all removed, and there'd be a new question up or a new type of challenge. And this is just one bathroom out of many. And there'd be different things in the different bathrooms. And, it's just a, it's a, a playful way to be able to bring the communities together, to have conversations in the littlest parts. It's just a lovely experience. So you know, I, I have worked with like all sorts of clients all around the world, from you know, the you know, the you know, just the Fortune 25, the Fortune 5, the tiniest startups to the largest organizations, you know, where companies have ever heard of. But I just wanted to show like I didn't I didn't I could talk about that for another hour, but I wanted to show one of my favorites. Um, experiences, which was working with Sesame Street, and, uh, and we got to go meet. We got to go and uh, go to the Sesame Street um, the, the set, and we got to meet Cookie Monster, and, and we got to meet Big Bird. Just, I, I just wanted to tie it back to Big Bird's busy book. We actually got to meet Big Bird, which was so cool. Like when this is, has anyone met Cookie Monster before? Cookie Monster is like, it's like you don't even see the performer. It's just like the it's it's it's, it's amazing what they do. So this is just like IDEO opened up doors and opportunities to work on projects and clients and you know, Cookie Monster or client. It was great. You know, it was very, very cool experiences of which I can actually talk very little about because of the, a lot of stuff that we did was very um, uh, under NBA. So I can't really talk about what we did at Sesame Street. But I, you know, with, with these, these, um, these ways in which I was able to engage with these clients gave me an IDEO, gave, gave me an opportunity to work with you know, the, the CEO and the executive suites. So like the, uh, the CEO of Sesame Workshop at this time was this a man named Gary Nell. And Gary Nell went on to uh, be the CEO of um, NPR for a couple of years, and then I think he's the CEO of National Geographic. And it was cool working with him and his leadership team, and uh, fascinating, fascinating work. But like Gary Nell was just one CEO I worked with, and other, I worked with lots of CEOs and SVPs, and, and it gave you a very good indication of what makes a good leader and you know, what makes not such a good leader, or what are these different ways in which people at that top of, you know, that, that top of you know, chain of command within these global companies, and how is it that they are motivating their people? When are they, how are they making their strategic moves? How are they setting up their organizations? Where are their, where are their pains and their barriers? We learned a lot about what makes an organization tick, what makes them, you know, a lot of companies come to I, when they came to IDEO to still come to IDEO to um, figure out how to make them, you know, a more innovative, more structurally, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, structurally strong, whatever it might be. But it, it gave you a lot of exposure to that. And I guess one of my, um, um, I just have a couple more these leadership lessons. But one of them was like, be the leader that you want to be led by. And, and this is just, it's a, it was an important aspect in regards to this exposure that we had to these C-suites um, over, you know, over a decade of working with different C-suites. But then also in, in, in comparison and context with IDEO that has a very, very flat organizational structure. So there's no hierarchy really at IDEO that you, you have seniority, but that the flat organizational structure was very much, um, you know, it, it, it was very different than what the companies that we were working with. 
and that you know, there's all these aspects of stepping into leadership roles when you saw the necessary you know, point in which to step into it, and knowing when the right places in which to do that, to be able, you know, to showcase your expertise, or to allow other people to step into leadership roles and making the spaces for them. So this is just an important kind of aspect as I've learned through more of these like senior, these like later chapters in my career. Um, that it's 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 looking for these leadership opportunities not only for myself but for others. So building on that, I'm here now at <laughs> the university for a third time, and this I, I think that it's really important to trust your instincts. When opportunities come up that are once in a lifetime, which is what this is, um, that it's I had to run to it. And as you can as, as we mentioned, you know I'm the director for this new Siegel Center for Design, and uh, this is going to be opening hopefully fall 2020. <laughs> We're hoping. Uh, so yeah, so this will be, um, you know, this, this is going to be an amazing building. <coughs> it's already uh, starting to be an amazing initiative. As you can see, some of my team members are here already. And you know, our, our our mission is to, you know, is to foster these multidisciplinary collaborations that I've been doing for many, many, many.